Well, greetings and welcome to The Dividing Line. I just came running in here just a few minutes ago. I have been running around like a chicken with his head cut off. Which a lot of people have never seen a chicken running around with its head cut off, um, when you think about it. And in fact, you know, there's so many things we say that we picked up when we were younger and can tell people where you're from, how old you are, all sorts of stuff like that. I was thinking of one just yesterday. I mentioned something about being, uh, and I was talking to myself. Um, and you got nothing to say about that, buddy, because it, when you're playing Tim the Toolman Taylor, it is a never ending monologue. <laughs> it is amazing. When he's working on something, it's just, and he's just talking, I don't know what he's talking to, but not talking to me. He's just talking to himself, and that's just how it works. Anyways, um, I was talking to myself, and I used a phrase that I use all the time. My kids will tell you, they say it all the time. Busier in a one-armed paper hanger. And I I've came to realize a couple days ago, there's nobody under 40 that has any earthly idea what in the world that means. Because does anyone even use wallpaper anymore? I mean, I, I, everything I see is just all, uh, you know, painting and stuff like that. But, you know, you used to have guys that, that had, they, they hung wallpaper. And so you'd, you know, it took two hands to put the glue and, and hang wallpaper up, up on a wall. And if you're a one arm paper hanger, um, you'd be very, very busy getting that one arm trying to do all that stuff at once. And it made perfect sense when I was a kid. But now we say that and the younger generation just goes, what? I actually used that phrase in a meeting uh, with one of my pastors a couple of weeks ago. And he looked at me with this. He was like, stop. And I'm, I'm continuing on the conversation. He's like, what, is, what did you, what is that? I've never heard that. And I'm like, you're in your forties. You've never, never in his life have he ever heard that. I think it's a Midwestern thing. I guess. But I tell you what, first of all, I've seen a chicken with his head cut off. I have personally seen it, but that's, you know, where I come from. So, but, you know, one on paper, well, hanger, normally, I have not actually witnessed. Look, look, normally when you cut off a chicken's head, it just dies. But sometimes if you hit it just right, yeah. they just go running around the barnyard without a head on. Yeah. But yes, yep. we, we have these uh, colloquialisms. Colloquialisms. That's what that, they are. Uh, are completely and when lost. traveling, back when I used to get to go overseas, uh, I had some I had some dear brothers from South Africa contact me this morning and said, are you ever going to come back? <laughs> I'm, I'm basically like, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't think so. Uh, I'm afraid those, those days are past. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, same thing. Same thing there. Um, okay, uh, I've got some stuff for homeschool kids at the start of the program today. Okay, so parents, um, if you've got homeschool kids, the first ones, the first thing is going to be uh, for homeschool kids that are a little bit younger, maybe um, not not quite as deep a subject. And um, then the second thing, <clears throat> a little bit older kids maybe your high school kids, something like that, something along those lines. I just, I, I so enjoyed um, talking with the high school kids a couple days ago. What was that, Thursday? Yeah, Thursday of last week. And, you know, my grandkids are homeschooled, <clears throat> and I just think homeschool kids are awesome, and they're family people, and they take care of each other, and it's awesome, and I think homeschooling is great, and it's right now about the only option we've got outside of really good, solid Christian schools. I, I get that, but there's just a, there's a, a quality to homeschooling. And um, so I was thinking about, and this would be something I would, I would share with my, hopefully, maybe my daughter will hear this and get the, uh, get the kids uh, around the... Uh, computer or however it is they're watching, if they're watching The Dividing Line today, or will later. Um, I was just over there, too, dropping off. <laughs> My truck smells like Thanksgiving and Christmas, because um, uh, yeah, last night, my wife diced up the celery and onions for my dad's 
dressing. Now, you had my dad's dressing. It was special, wasn't it? Yes. He says yes. Um, so, Because somebody on Twitter said, did you see that? I think that person should be kicked off Twitter. Yes, because <laughs> somebody on Twitter said stuffing stinks or is horrible or gross. It's gross. It's gross. I did respond with one word, blocked. <laughs> I didn't block him. I just want people to know that. I mean, there are people who just have really, really bad taste. Um, and you're, some of you are looking at my sweater right now going, yes, that's true. Um, but uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, so there is there are certain ingredients that have to go in that dressing. And my son-in-law, Eric, is doing the turkey. And... Um, uh, we have a photocopy because I have the original, the original, I mean, 1950s vintage recipe. I still have it. Uh, my mom gave it to us before she died. And um, so Eric's got a lot, a lot of pressure because I tried to do that. And I got close a couple times, but I'm not a cook. I'm just not. And I might get it one year and the next year. It's just complete disaster. Uh, you know, utter disaster. Who knows? <clears throat> but we'll, we'll see what happens tomorrow. But you have, to, you have to slice the onions and the celery and the smell. And I remember my mom weeping <laughs> and my wife weeping. And even though we've gotten machines and stuff like that still, the, the whole house. And that's what I brought over today uh, was the turkey pan and stuff like that. And, and yet you, I don't care what you do. I don't care what you put a sliced onion inside. It can be triple steel walled you'll still smell it <laughs> that smell can get through absolutely anything it really really can it's amazing stuff anyhow what were we talking about moses was in the bull rushes okay um uh hope you all have a great uh thanksgiving tomorrow uh if you're having that opportunity to do so we're gonna have one two three four families uh gathering uh in in our place and then just if you're praying folks I head out very early the next morning on, on our next trip, which I'm really, really, really looking forward to. And it's all up on the, on the um, calendar now, too, uh, if you want to know where I'll be stopping. Pretty much on the way back. I'm not stopping on the way out. When you're trying to get a long distance, uh, you have to make those days a little bit longer uh, driving-wise. Uh, but I will be stopping at a couple different places, three, three different places, actually, on the way back uh, home in uh, December. Anyways, for our homeschooled kids, many of you have memorized uh, verses from the 119th Psalm, Psalm 119. And many of you will be aware of the fact that Psalm 119 is, one, uh, is the longest psalm in the Psalter. And so one thing that I think you might find very interesting is that the 119th Psalm is an acrostic poem, an acrostic poem. And some of your Bibles, I was looking, interestingly enough, through uh, a number of my English Bibles in accordance, and it could be that I have a setting someplace where I've turned this kind of stuff off, maybe, but I know I've seen in printed Bibles uh, translations that will, in fact, I think in the New American Standard, um, that will give you the Hebrew letter that begins each eight-verse section. So, depending on how you count them, there's, there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And Psalm 119, you have eight verses and they go in the order of the Hebrew alphabet. So I actually have it on the screen. I don't know if you, if you can grab that or not. Um, but um, if, you, if you look at the original language, uh, we're going to have to blow that up, I'm afraid, because that's way, way too small. Um, there we go. Okay, so notice over here in the translation, it says A-L-P-H. That's Aleph. And you see in the Greek Septuagint, this is the Greek translation, here's Aleph, and then 
Alf is how it's, uh, they have it. But there, so this is, this is this letter right here. Well, sorry, can't really just get it to show you that. But you could, this is an Aleph. That, that word starts with Alf. Now, remember something about Hebrew. Hebrew is written from the right to the left instead of the way we write, from the left to the right. And so the first letter of this word is on the right-hand side rather than on the left-hand side. That's one of the fun things about learning Hebrew is you got to get your mind going backwards. And so notice this, this word starts with Aleph. 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 All the way down through verse 8, and then beginning of verse 9, the next letter is Bet. And so there's your bet there, there's your bet there, and it goes all the way through the Hebrew alphabet. So the writer of the 119th Psalm, and in case the next column is confusing you over here, because it says Psalm 118 here, and it says Psalm 118 here, but it says Psalm 119 here and Psalm 119 there. Why is that? Well, that's because this is the Greek Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And the um, Psalms are numbered differently in the Greek Septuagint than they are in the Hebrew text and hence in our English translations today, <clears throat> which can make finding references very, very tricky at times. But the point is that the person who wrote this Psalm, and I had a, I had a, professor at Grand Canyon College, <clears throat> and I don't know why I remember this. He was a wonderful, wonderful man, Dr. D.C. Martin. I just realized I forgot my uh, green drinky thingy, uh, the uh, re refrigerator, please, thank you. Uh, the older I get, the more I need to wet the whistle once in a while. <clears throat> um, D.C. Martin, just a wonderful saint of God. I didn't agree with everything he said about the Old Testament, but he was, he was a really good Old Testament scholar. And I just remember, out of all the things that the D.C. said, um, and everybody only knew him by D.C., it's Davis Carroll was his, uh, was his old you know, southern, southern gentleman. So they, Davis, Davis Carroll Mark, uh, I think was what it was. You know, I trust Rich a lot to just hand me something, I just immediately drink it, because if he wanted, if he wanted to take over the ministry, <laughs> just, whoop, whoop. <laughs> all over with. Anyway, DC Martin said that he thought Psalm 119 was uh, a rabbi's uh, class assignment, <laughs> and he he assigned Olive to one student, and Bet, and then Gimel, and Dalit, and so on and so forth down down the line. And uh, that's how Psalm 119 came to be. I don't think that's the case, but <clears throat> but the point is, you could be, it, it would be really interesting. Ooh, oh man, I might make some of the homeschool students angry with me if I say this, but it'd be an interesting assignment, wouldn't it? To try to write a poem. And the subject of all of it is the same. There's, there's like five or six words law, commandments, et cetera, et cetera, that define the 119th Psalm. It's about God's word, God's commandments, God's holy law. And so it would be interesting to try to write a, a poem that every line in the poem begins with a different letter like this does. So the first four or eight or however long you wanted to make the thing, uh, begin with an A, and then a B, and then a C, and so on and so forth, while also maintaining, <clears throat> excuse me, the same topics that you would be, that you would be addressing. That would be an interesting homeschool project <laughs> for somebody to do. Um, but yes, Psalm 19, the acrostic poem, the long acrostic pro poem following the uh, Hebrew alphabet, uh, which of course long precedes the English language. I mean, that, that acrostic poem was written in Hebrew, um, 
2,000 years before the English language came into existence. And even then, you wouldn't really recognize the English language as it first came into existence. So long, long ago, long, long ago. So that, that alphabet is much, much earlier than, than ours. Okay, you can take that, uh, that down. And uh, so the second thing, just for um, some of the more advanced uh, students, homeschoolers, um, you, you've undoubtedly, I'm sure, almost all homeschoolers have had conversations with mom and dad about Romans chapter one. There are, you know, I've, I've been defending, um, and debating the word of God, defending the word of God in debate, uh, for over 30 years, 32 years now, since it started in 1990. And people often ask me, why do you believe, why do you continue to believe in the word of God? You've spoken to all these atheists and they've thrown all these alleged contradictions at you and things like that. Why do you still continue uh, to believe? And aside from the fact that the contradictions are generally based upon their ignorance uh, or our ignorance as human beings and, and not problems actually in the word of God. One of the reasons that I would point to is Romans 1. I've said this many times. Romans chapter 1 is supernatural. It, it describes man and his thinking, and yet it transcends language and culture. It's just as true of the remote um, Central American tribe or South Pacific tribe. Um, it's just as true of them as it is the most cultured Englishman or person from China or whatever it might be. It doesn't matter what the language is, doesn't matter what the background is. Romans 1 nails mankind. It is universally applicable. And I don't think there's anything else like it. I, I mean, Romans 1 tells us more about mankind than all of the psychology uh, and psychiatric books that have ever been published that are based upon man's theories and speculations and stuff like that. And so when we read Romans 1, in one of the most important of those verses, verse 20, um, well, we back up a little bit. The text is talking about how, how men suppress the truth. They, they suppress the truth and unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. So God has made a revelation of certain aspects of his being. And they're listed for us in verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. So his invisible attributes, all of them, um, all the attributes of God, the, the true statements given to us in scripture about, about God's being, well, no, not all of them. There's specific ones. And that is his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. And what does that hold man accountable to? Well, verse 21, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. And so the revelation that God has made of himself in creation is sufficient to teach us that we are to honor God as God and give thanks, which is what which is what we'll be doing tomorrow, since this is the day before Thanksgiving in the United States. And it's what secularists who deny God will still feel the need to do without knowing who in the world to address to give the thanks to. And that's because they're suppressing, they're holding down the truth in unrighteousness. Now, with all that said, you might ask the question, it says his eternal power and divine nature. His eternal power and divine nature. Now, 
what's interesting here is if you have something like the King James Version of the Bible, um, and I'm not, we're not getting into, it looks like, actually, um, I, I got word last night that um, it looks like we are going to be able to have a King James Version debate in February in Tennessee when I go back to uh, do the um, uh, conference with Jeffrey Rice. Um, and I need to, you know, I want to let everybody know in the Tennessee area, um, you know, we need to get folks there to make it work, uh, basically. And so I, I need to get that, I, I've already tweeted it once, but I need to get it up on the website uh, so that Jeffrey knows. See, a lot, of, a lot of folks these days, you know, there's so many uncertainties in the future that it's hard to plan things. And, but it's pretty tough for Jeffrey to be planning it without knowing if anybody's going to show up. So uh, look up Jeffrey Rice on Facebook. Look up post Tenverse Lux on Facebook. Uh, he's the guy that does the beautiful, beautiful, beautiful rebinds. You know, here's my Tyndale House Greek New Testament. Um, super duper well done. And uh, uh, we're going to have a uh, King James only debate. With a with what should be a, a well prepared um, opponent, um, we can't get any of the King James only fundamentalist guys that run around the stage screaming "Amen" and "Hey" and stuff like that. Um, they're just too busy running around the stages screaming "Hey, Amen, Hey, man." Um, I, I've retweeted that one. Remember, remember they, uh, I did that whole thing where I played that guy's sermon and, uh, then, uh, uh, Kuiper belt went ahead and found that and, and put up a counter. How many times he said, uh, amen and Hey, and Hey man, and all the rest of that kind of stuff. It was, it was great. Um, but anyway, so, uh, keep an eye out for that. And if you're, if you're making plans, uh, for, um, I think it's the second, third weekend. It, it's sort of somewhere around there in February. I need to get the ex exact stuff up. Uh, make sure to let Jeffrey Rice know and go on the website and say, yep, I'm coming and stuff like that. But um, so I'm not trying to uh, go after that particular uh, issue uh, right now and talk about King James onlyism and all the rest of that kind of stuff. But in the King James, the word is translated, it's even his eternal power and Godhead. Godhead. Now, that's not exactly the language that we use um, today in, in our English language. Um, but that's what it says, eternal power and Godhead in the King James Version of the Bible. And if you were to look up the term Godhead, you would find the King James also uses it to Colossians 2.9, for in him all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. So what is Godhead? Well, it was obviously a much more commonly used term in the past than it is today. And the important thing Again, speaking to our homeschool kids, the important thing is to remember that when Paul wrote Romans 1 and when Paul wrote Colossians 2, there was no English language. The English language didn't exist yet. Uh, I'd say the earliest you could posit the existence of a distinctly English language is 1000 AD for the most primitive, but English is a is a mixed bag from Germanic tribes and Latin, and it's just all sorts of stuff that came together to form this very, very odd language. Um, and so the real issue isn't what does Godhead mean? The real issue is what terms did Paul use? And what did he mean to communicate? Because when you think about it, Colossians 2.9 says, for in him, all the fullness 
of, and the Greek term is theatetas, dwells in bodily form. And this is meant to, to, to point out that the standard is Christ, the standard for all mankind, the standard for non Christians is Christ. Why? Because in him, all the fullness of deity, that which makes God God, dwells in bodily form. And so that, that's referring to the, the very essence of God. Is that what Romans 1 is talking about? For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature. So do trees reveal the very essence of God, that which makes God, God? Well, no, they don't. There is a limitation to what the created order can um, reveal because it's created, it's finite, it's limited. So obviously, Paul's thinking of different things, and when you go back to the original languages, that's why he didn't use the same words. They're very close. They're very close. Theatetas, Colossians 2 9. Theates. There's an extra iota, one little stroke, what we would call the letter I in Romans 120, but it changes the meaning of the word. It's now talking about divine nature in a much less specific, much more general sense than the much stronger term theatetos at Colossians 2.9. So modern translations recognize that and translate them accordingly. And you might ask, well, why the King James translators translate two different words with the same English word? Well, that's not the only, only place that happens. But the problem here is doing that when it's the same author in different contexts communicating something different, that's where it has led to certain levels of confusion. And um, if I recall correctly, there was only one committee in the King James, in the work of the King James that, that did Paul. And so you would think they would have caught that but they didn't. And so it's there. So what's important is, the, the point to communicate is, it is important to know what the underlying text says, because translations don't always get it right and don't always give the most clear and compelling translation in, um, in the process. So I think that's something to, to keep in mind. All right, switching to uh, other topics, I'm, I hope you're with me and you are <laughs> sitting here seeing the, the story of this high market company, I'd never heard of them, that sells ridiculously priced stuff that put out an advertisement that was plainly a, a seeking to promote. And in fact, parents, we're going to have to, we're, for a second, we'll be talking about something you might not want the kids around. Um, trying to promote pedophilia, grooming, um, sex with minors, all this kind of stuff. And Thankfully, one news outlet, Fox, especially Tucker Carlson, now I'd seen it first on Twitter. Gotta admit, I, I don't care what anybody says. Twitter has changed over the past couple of weeks. Um, in fact, Twitter is now marketing as, and showing as much savvy as Facebook. I don't do much on Facebook. I've never, you know, I've never been a big Facebook fan. You dragged me into that kicking and screaming. Um, but, you know, Facebook monitors everything you hit like on and tries to throw stuff at you based on that. And so you can learn to 
play games with Facebook by, you know, for a while I was liking every watch ad that came by. And so the, all I got were real, really pretty watches. <laughs> so it's, and nothing else, especially the stuff I didn't like, was, wasn't popping up anymore. So, oh, okay, that's one way of doing it. Um, Twitter is now throwing ads at me that are actually relevant to me. Um, I understand he's like fired 90% of the people in that company. What? Man, did those people have it good and easy for a long, long time. But now they're working at McDonald's. So I think that's really cool. And, and the timing of it is really incredible because Facebook's laying off. Right. So uh, I, what is, what's the parent company uh, that they came up with? I can't remember. Y yeah, Meta. Meta. Meta is laying off. So it's like the entire tech sector is shrinking while these people are sitting back going, I'm not coming to his meeting. Well, you're fired. What you going to do now, hero? <laughs> yes, it is. It is fascinating. Anyway, um, I had seen this story first on Twitter. about the, It's a company that starts with a B. I, again, never heard of it. If you've got the kind of money to be able to buy baby clothes that cost 1500 bucks, <laughs> when that kid's going to going to grow out of it in about two and a half weeks well uh, okay that's 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 not my world anyway this these evil vile people are and of course they've they've now come out with statements saying we've fired the person responsible for this and la 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 oh come on you're you're you know what you're doing you're throwing somebody out of the bus because but you you knew what you were doing don't don't give us that. Just boycott that company, drive them into the ground. Um, but there, but it won't happen. We have and 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 we have so many people in Western society today that are now, you know, with the Colorado Springs shooting. <laughs> the narrative was one thing immediately. One thing we we certainly should have learned over the past decade. Whatever the first story is, is a lie. It's not even worth interacting with. It's not going to be the final thing. In fact, that, that reminds me, there's, um, there's a 30-minute video that somebody put out called The Broken Boys of Kenosha. Did you see it? Called The Broken Boys of Kenosha. John Cooper sent it to me a couple weeks ago, and I hadn't seen it yet. And um, so Luke sent it out. And I said, okay, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at it. And it's really good because it goes through the Blake shooting, which was in Kenosha, which started all this stuff. Remember the NBA, you know, NBA teams refusing to play and protest, all the rest of the stuff. It goes through the seven points that were put out immediately and documents all seven of them were lies that he was armed, uh, that he wasn't, that wasn't his car. He was stealing his wife's car and uh, he was supposed to have the kids and, and he had a knife in his hand and all this stuff uh, that he had been tased and continued to resist and all the rest of the stuff. But then what they did that nobody will do on any news outlet is they went through how he came to be who he was his father had you know, fathered him and then just left. That is a massive major problem in the black community. Um, I remember the uh, program a couple years ago where they brought all these young black men in and one guy had 28 kids by about 14 different women. And, uh, you know, baby mama, baby daddy, that's, that's the term. That's the terminology you use in a, a completely broken community where the family's gone. And so he goes through and documents this. This guy grew up without a father. It's fatherlessness. We've been saying this for a long time, and you get accused of of everything under the sun. And then they go through and they talk about the guys in Kenosha that got shot by the young white kid. Now they also point, point out the young white uh, um, Kyle. Was well, Rittenhouse? Kyle Rittenhouse. They talk about how his family is broken. And both of the guys that ended up dying 
that he that he shot. Talk about completely messed up families. No fathers. And one of the two had been released from the psych ward. And in fact, in one of the pictures, he's swinging the bag from the psych ward that had his stuff in it at somebody. That's how he had it been literally hours. And the whole the whole film, I I think it was the second guy. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Maybe. Um, but the the whole point of the film was this is what fatherlessness and the breakup of the family does. This is what this is what it created uh, on both sides of the events, and uh, it was it was powerful. It'll be completely ignored, uh, but it was it was very very powerful in the process. Um, so. Anyway, we are seeing this society uh, because of its abject rejection of God's will, God's way, God's law, deciding uh, that children are abusable, throwaway things. You can use them as you wish. There is, we, we literally are becoming a society of people, anybody who can sit there and ta talk about uh, family-friendly drag queen story hours just has absolutely no morality, no moral compass, no system of ethics left. I, I cannot imagine, and I'm, I'm a child of the 60s, okay, I was born in the early part of the 1960s. And my parents talked about how society was changing, it was going crazy and all the rest of that kind of stuff. Um, nobody at, in that day, nobody would have ever dreamed of the kind of blatant sexualization of young people that we're seeing today, nobody. And still today, you get thrown into prison doing something like that. You ain't gonna last long because even the prison inmates have enough morality left to know that's wrong. <laughs> that, no, mm -mm. you don't, you don't, you don't do that to kids. No, no, you do that and, and you're not gonna get out of here in one piece, functional anyways. And so, but today the, the leading voices in media, they're all, if you dare speak out on any of these things, if you dare oppose the LGBTQ revolution in any form whatsoever, um, you should be sued into oblivion, uh, you should have charges brought against you, whatever it might be. And once the Constitution is truly just shredded, which unless there is a massive change of things is going to happen. I mean, you might be sitting here going, yeah, well, we've got uh, five uh, conservative Supreme Court justices. A bunch of them are really old, okay? And we saw in the, in the midterms, the fully secularized, fully ethically lobotomized uh, 18 to 29 year olds voted and they're going to keep voting. And that means eventually all the old guys on the court die off. And once you have five or six, uh, like the ideologues we already have on the court, uh, like Brown and stuff like that, who have absolutely, uh, positively, um, no, uh, concept of the constitution at all. Uh, once they're in the majority, the, the, the constitution is just a piece of paper. If it will be interpreted um, by people in that fashion, there's nothing that can be done. It's, it's done. And so once that happens, then these people will take all the political power and they will take the police power 
and you know what they want to do. You know what they want to do and what they're going to try to accomplish. Um, so Lord help us. Um, Lord, Lord help us truly. Um, I mentioned this Thomas Horrocks guy on the last program. And I may have even mentioned this tweet. I'm not sure, but I, I don't remember going to this text. But um, a progressive, a little strange that so many of the folks who want to swing their Bible around to protest civil protections for gay, gay marriage seem to skip right over the part where scripture explicitly says that Christians aren't supposed to judge the sexuality of outsiders. Did I read that before? A little strange that so many of the folks who want to swing their Bible around to protest civil protections for gay marriage. This is not David French, by the way. <laughs> um, though David French is heading this direction quickly. Uh, seem to skip right over the part where scripture explicitly says that Christians aren't supposed to judge sexuality of outsiders. The only thing I can think of here, the only thing I can think of, is he's talking about 1 Corinthians uh, and judging those that are in, on the inside, not the outside. That's it. I, no reference was given. So, as if what that means is that Christians aren't supposed to recognize the utter um, depravity of the immorality of, of the nations. I, I, I don't know. But the, the, the first thought across my mind when I saw this was, have you, have you read Leviticus 18? Leviticus 18 specifically lays out the sins that were committed by the people who lived in the land of Canaan, the Canaanites, for which God was judging them, for which God said to the people of Israel, wipe them out, man, woman, and child, because of the sins that they have committed. And what were those sins? Everything promoted by the LGBTQ revolution homosexuality, bestiality, uh, incest, it's all there. Um, and, and it says literally that the land spewed them out. The land spewed them out. It was so unnatural what they were doing that, that nature itself spit them out, spit them out. And so I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this and I, I go, you know, quote unquote progressives. And of course they always try to use terms like that. They're the only, only, only direction they are progressing is toward utter apostasy. I mean, that's, that's all there is to it. There's, there's no other way to put it, but the, the way in which they read scripture, um, is, is truly, truly amazing. It really, really is. Um, so just a couple of other items, cause, um, I'm actually going to be, uh, joining Ryan Aris with, um, the Ezra Institute in, um, and I'm, you know, I'm wondering if Joe will actually, no, I don't think Joe's gonna be able to make it, but who knows, maybe he'll surprise us, but, uh, we're going to be talking about, um, uh, Thomas and the Baptist, basically. Um, the Ezra Institute's been doing some programs on the subject of the uh, renaissance of Thomism amongst uh, Protestants. And so we're going to record something uh, just after we finish the program here. So uh, busy, busy day uh, right before Thanksgiving. But uh, I wanted to actually, you know what? I, we, we should have tested this. And I now have the audio going the right direction. Let me see if I can, I had this queued up. Yeah. There was a, um, the Southern California Reformed Baptist Pastors Conference took place recently at Trinity Reformed Baptist Church in La Mirada, California. 
and uh, during the Q and A period, there was a interesting discussion, and I I wanted to play a portion of it just to give you a sense of some of the things being said. I hope I have it queued up here. I hope it's going to play because I queued this up for the last program, and you know how that works. <laughs> Very often it just goes, what? We, we broke that connection a long time ago. But let's, uh, let's see if this, uh, if this works. And the first time I ever learned about the extra Calvinistic, I'm like, no, the church had been confessing that for <laughs> centuries at that point, millennia and a half. They, they like to make Calvin a whipping boy because they called him a Judaizer, too, in his Old Testament commentaries, because he didn't see Christ there often enough. He was a Judaizer, though. Not intentionally. That's for another discussion. <clears throat> okay, now, I just, I just want to point out what's going on here. And I can't turn it up any louder. It's as loud as it gets. Um, they're talking about Lutherans and Reformed at the time of Reformation. Reformation. The extra Calvinisticum was the language that Lutherans used. And um, then I think that was Jim Renahan. This, this isn't a video, so I'm just going on voices. I think that was Jim Renahan saying, well, you know, Lutherans accused uh, Calvin of being a Judaizer. And over him, Richard Brasella says he was. He was a Judaizer. And you can hear Jim just stop. It's like, what, <laughs> what, what, what did you just say? Um, so I, I let me confessing that for <laughs> centuries at that point, millennia and a half. They they like to make Calvin a whipping boy because they called him a Judaizer too in his Old Testament commentaries because he didn't see Christ there often enough. He was a Judaizer though, not intentionally. That's for another discussion. <clears throat> did did anyone define uh, nope. the, the term? In what? The extra the Calvinist. Extra no, Rich is going to define it for you. I'm going to let somebody right else define saying it. Saying Calvin was a Judaizer. The doc. <laughs> I'll, I'll explain myself. I'm right about that. <laughs> There's a book called Judaizing Calvin, something like that. The uh, doctrine that the incarnate. There is, okay? We just got to deal with reality. <laughs> Go ahead and do the extra Calvin. Even Go some contemporary the... Westminster uh, Confession of Faith theologians admit that Calvin often took non-traditional views on Old Testament texts that were either found as adumbrated Trinitarian texts or Christological texts. Like texts on the descent of Christ? Samuel, you're too young. <clears throat> that's, that's another issue, but, but Calvin does take novel views, okay? So what happened, what happened, and Calvin didn't intend this, but there were graduates from uh, Geneva that ended up becoming anti-Trinitarians. And the reason why they did is because of Calvin's tendency at times to just be interested in the historical or um, literal sense, which caused him to be very much unlike Augustine in the Psalms. Okay, now, now that, that was the part I wanted you to hear. <clears throat> because um, I made reference to a thread, and I, I think I linked to it, um, I did. Okay. Um, where we gave some example, where Chris Wisden gave a bunch of examples and there's far, far more that could be given of Augustine's reading of the Psalms. And he reads them as if they are new Testament literature, the actual context, its role in the, in the, the life of Israel, all that stuff does not matter. What matters is how you can read into these words 
fulfillment in the New Testament. And it's, it's almost in every single song. Um, so that, you know, numerology and numbers and, well, I, I think I did read for you the idea of the drum. You have to spread skin across wood to make it a drum. And so since Jesus's skin was spread across the wood of the cross, then you make the connection to drumming in one of the Psalms. And so in other words, it, it unlike uh, Spurgeon and really unlike um, the Reformed since the Reformation, where you had a recovery of grammatical historical interpretation, you had a a moving away from the allegorical uh, interpretation of the medieval period, and certainly away from Origen's division of the meanings of Scripture into all these subcategories. Um, you know, this led to, you know, the need to learn Hebrew again, and and all the, all this other, really positive, wonderful stuff, which doesn't keep you from unbelief. I mean, we have, I don't understand why someone would learn Hebrew and Greek that doesn't actually believe it's the inspired word of God, but there are people that do. And that, that's amazing stuff. But anyway, so what was said by Dr. Rosellos, now he didn't name anybody, this is just a Q&A, but I'd really be interested in knowing who were these graduates from Geneva whatever that means, uh, graduates from Geneva that became anti-Trinitarian. First of all, I'd like to know who they were. I'd like to be able to access their writings myself. And secondly, the assertion is that they became anti-Trinitarian because Calvin didn't read the Psalms like Augustine. Hmm. Now, I have a hunch that that's probably a real overreading. But hey, I'd be interested in looking, especially because I've defended the doctrine of the Trinity for a long time without ever having to adopt an allegorical reading of the Psalter to do so. And I don't think that Augustine's reading of the Psalter would be defensible against any kind of well-read opposition. Um, when I see, for example, and I've pointed this out, I pointed it out in my book on the Quran. When I see the author of the Quran displaying a fundamental ignorance of the historical backgrounds of the Hebrew scriptures and the content of the Hebrew scriptures. The, the fact that the, um, the author thinks that a lot of the Gnostic writings were a, were a part of the Christian canon or were a part of the Hebrew canon. He had no idea what the canon actually was one way or the other. Uh, I am engaging in a form of source criticism. And so I have to be really consistent at this point in utilizing the same standards in my criticism that I would then use in the defense of my own scriptures. And that's why I've been saying, I've, I've said more than once, that I really think our neo thomistic brothers who are involved in their resourcement of the sources of the confession ought to get out of the Reformed Baptist Facebook groups and do some serious interaction with people outside the faith. And you'll discover pretty quickly that you, you can't keep going this direction and defend the faith itself. You'll end up having to compromise things. 
the doctrine of justification, for example, is not defensible utilizing medieval exegetical techniques. It's not. The strongest uh, defense of the doctrine of justification will be found by utilizing the grammatical, historical, interpretive method, looking at the specific meaning of the entire argument from Romans 3 through 5, um, reading Galatians in the context of Paul writing to the churches in Galatia. You, if you, but he uses an allegory in there. Yeah, and he calls it that. He lays it out. He shows us what he's doing. But the specific teaching that he gives, the specific meaning of the words, the Dikaiao group, the Zedekah group, those are grammatical historical realities, and they are the foundation of the doctrine of justification by faith. And so if you're going to hold to that doctrine, you're not going to hold that doctrine and at the same time say, we need to go to pre-modern exegesis, because it wasn't pre-modern exegesis that uh, gave us the Reformation. Now, were there people who believed in justification by faith before the medieval period? Of course, we've looked at, we've looked at Clement, of, Clement of Rome. We've looked at uh, the Epistle of Diognetus. It, it's Pauline from the start. How'd they, how'd they get to that? They didn't get to that through medieval exegesis. They got to that from taking the text directly and seriously. That's, that's how they did it. So one of the important things that we're, we're doing here in standing for a meaningful and defensible exegetical uh, approach is recognizing that the things we believe that are central to the gospel, that's where they come from. That's, that's how we've always understood them. And you abandon that view of scripture and you're going to end up having to abandon those perspectives as well. So I'd really like to know who, who were these students of Calvin? How did they become anti-Trinitarian? What, what do you mean by anti-Trinitarian? What, what positions did they take? And how do you prove that it was because Calvin read the Old Testament with too much of a concern about its historical validity and reality and didn't read it like Augustine did. Because when I read Augustine on those, you know, doing that kind of stuff, I'm just like, um, okay, not very useful. Not very useful at all. I, when I read that kind of stuff, I go, man, I'm thankful for the Reformation. And so now I'm hearing people who call themselves children of that Reformation saying, now we got to go back to the old way. And I'm like, I'm not going back to the old way. <laughs> and I, I, don't, I don't know anybody else who wants to go back to the old way either, but okay. Um, so it was the same Richard Brasellis that said on Twitter, true or false, he does all these true or false things that I find ex exceptionally annoying. Tradition is the method by which the Holy Spirit causes the truth of Scripture to pass into the consciousness and life of the church. And a young Reformed Baptist uh, pastor responded by saying, True, since doctrine moves through language and language is necessarily traditioned, I do not think we should have a problem admitting the necessity of tradition in the transmission of Christian dogma throughout the historical life of the church. Now, I know what he's saying, but I hope what you, what you need to recognize is instead of allowing scripture to define these terms, especially the term tradition, you're taking modern definitions of these terms and reading them backwards. So uh, tradition is the method by which the Holy Spirit caused the truth of scripture to pass in the consciousness and life of the church. Um, that's probably taken from someone who's talking about the Christian tradition derived from scripture. That's probably the context. But the problem is if you use it without that context, 
because I'm familiar with the passage, I think it's from Bavink, I think, where he has just talked about um, Christian, uh, tr Christian truth flowing out of Scripture and becoming what we call Christian tradition. That's completely different from the use of the term tradition. And I would think, I've been trying to warn him, but I would think these days, with how many people you, know, you see regularly, it's primarily because they announce their conversion, uh, leaving Protestantism for Roman Catholicism, that you might want to be careful in your use of terminology. And uh, either that or it's just, we don't care because we're not biblicists anymore, so we don't, we don't worry about what words meant in Scripture first, uh, as if the church of, as if the, the sheep aren't going to default to the biblical usage. You know, we'll, we'll give them a, a different usage, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. But um, clarity doesn't seem to be the, the goal um, these days in, in a lot of different contexts. Anyways, all right. Like I said, I've got another program to do in just a matter of moments. And so uh, I do hope uh, that you have a wonderful Thanksgiving day. Please pray for me as I start traveling on Friday. Heading for St. Charles, uh, important time uh, there, talking about the Trinity and why we believe the Trinity. We're going to be specifically emphasizing the fact that the Trinity is a biblical doctrine. It is a biblical doctrine. So we're going to be talking a lot more about Nicaea, Chalcedon, stuff like that, their relationship to divine revelation, which I also did in Sunday's sermon at Apologia, if you are interested in, uh, in that. So, Lord willing, we'll see you from the road uh, next week on some, well, either we'll do some uh, road trip dividing lines, which we will, and uh, be watching for some uh, driving lines as well, uh, because uh, those are fun to do as well. We'll see you next time. God bless.